mix is connections, sockets, ports, related, and protocol. That actually means packets are related. A socket is a, an established path or connection through the internet. It's called a socket. It usually is an IP, a destination IP, a destination port, and a source IP and a source port. Okay, and that's called a socket. So it's a connection between two endpoints. So if you have something that goes through the internet, um, obviously in this case we say that's a, a NATed gateway. So a socket will typically be from there to there. The whole thing will be seen as a socket. It's almost like a pipe. And that's actually where it comes from. It's like a pipe that goes through the internet. It's from here to there. Depending on what protocol you use, it is called different things. And, and each protocol handles these sockets a bit differently. If you want to see the open sockets on your PC, if you're using Linux, you can say netstat dash uh, space dash n. And it will just print out all your current connections with PC that's open. If you want to know what servers are listening on your PC, you can just add a L at the end as well. So it's been L. It will show you all your listening sockets. We'll get into that lastly. Um, all right, let's actually get into it now. But there's basically, when you establish a socket, there's always two parties in this connection or socket. One is your server, was referred to as your server. The other one is referred to as your client. They never swap, they're always the same way around. So whether the packet travels from here to there or from there to there, they are always one way around. Most of the time, if we are in a, like in the office here, we're in a private subnet, everybody in the private subnet is a client. And usually servers, which are accessing the host websites and videos and torrents and whatever, they are servers. Okay. This is not the PC, it's an application. So an app that you can install can become a server, where it actually listens on a port. So a server listens, and a client connects or initiates. So that's the thing that starts the socket, that gets it going. A socket always have a direction of start. But the direction always goes from the client to the server. Always, that's how it starts. So if you set up firewalls and routing and stuff, always need to take that into account. That the packet goes from the client to the server. If you're using the TCP IP protocol, that is a registered or agreed connection. It's very controlled. So basically what will happen in that case is TCP will say, cool, this guy wants to connect to that guy. Then we will send a packet, which is like a, a connect packet, a basically like a request for connection packet. And we'll say, I want to connect to this IP and this port. As soon as it gets here, this guy will reply. He will send back a packet and say, yes, you can connect. This, this is my, this is the port, IP, whatever. And we'll send the packet back, and then you will know, cool, okay, the connection is established. And also everybody along the way, all the gateways along the way, knows about this connection. They keep track of this connection. So they know that this connection exists, and they also control this connection. So as soon as the connection is established, then what happens, now you can send data through this connection, which is basically more packets. But it's already established, it's agreed that this is a connection. So both sides agrees first, like, cool, I'm ready to chat. Then, then you can, in essence, send packets in both directions, it doesn't matter. So most firewalls, when you configure them, um, if the connection is already established, you don't have to configure an established connection. You just have to configure the first packet that goes through. Um, what TCPIP does is, like I said, it also does controlling and checking. So what it will do from each server to the next server, it will make sure that that packet is delivered properly. So when it does that stretch there, it will actually transmit the server to that packet. And one of these layers in the packet will actually contain a CRC check. And it contains a sequence number. So this is packet number 5 in the long stream that I'm sending. And this is the CRC. As soon as it gets to um, this gateway, this gateway will see if it matches. If it's packet number 5, it will see if it actually has already received packet number 4. If it hasn't, then it, obviously something's wrong. 
it needs to make sure it gets back at number four first before it gets back to number five. So it always checks if it's in the right order, and it checks that the, data, the packets aren't corrupt. Now TCP IP does it on every stretch. It does it there, make sure it's delivered. If it's not, it will ask to send it again, and it will send it. You say, cool, now I get this packet, send this packet. As soon as everything's shot, then it will do it there. It will go back and forth until this thing is successfully delivered. And every step, every jump, it will do that check, error checking. That's part of the TCP protocol control and checking. Control the sequence to make sure everything's delivered and there's CRC checked. That's why if you send stuff through TCP you don't actually have to do a CRC check. 99.999% of the chance it's going to come through right. I have seen instances where it's broken. Um, I'm not sure why, but you can actually trust that it's fine. I think it might have been just a route or something somewhere that actually didn't do a CRC check and that's why you get broken data. Then you get UDP, which is the complete opposite <laughs> of TCP. You can just blast data to anywhere. It's like, oh, I've got this bunch of packets here, I'm just sending it there, and you send, and you blast data. If that guy doesn't exist, you can still send the data. It will still go to that subnet. It will just somewhere there, somebody will just say, oh, this IP doesn't exist, and the packets will be dropped. But you can still send it. And what it will actually do is, it, uh, as the packet goes through the internet, the, the, the routes can, with, with the TCP connection, it uses the same route. Because the gateways along the route remembers the connection. It will always follow the same route. With UDP, it won't follow the same route. Some of the packets will go that route, some of the packets will go that route. If there's eight routes, it will just distribute them in eight routes, it will just go everywhere. Okay. On the remote side, um, yeah. If there is someone listening, obviously they can reply to the source address, whatever it's sending from, and it will actually get back to you. Um, with matting, it's a little bit different, as, as well as with firewalls. Um, it looks at, the, it, it remembers that there was a packet that went through it. So in this network address translation table that you get, yeah, if the UDP packet goes through it, it actually adds it to the table. Even though it's not an actual connection, it still adds it to the table. If the other guy replies, it knows how to forward it back into the private subnet. Okay. But that is called the initial packet. So it's the first one. The one that comes back is technically related to the first one. So that's why on firewalls you always have to add related as a rule. This is now the very low level firewalls. Like your IP tables one in one X. You actually you can't just say allow this connection to block that connection. You have to always say Allow all related packets. <laughs> if you don't add that rule, then it's very difficult to set up the, the firewall in general. Because then the one way works, but the other way doesn't. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, ICMP. Oh yeah, and obviously UDP, there's no control and no checking. So the packet will just get straight, sent straight from there, transmit to there, that will just transmit, transmit, transmit until it gets there. If, first of all, it might not even get there. It might just, somewhere along the line, there's a transmission error and the packet might just die. Second of all, it can get there, but it's corrupt. So that means your application needs to take that into account if you're using UDP connections. So you need to do your own CRC checking. So if you create an app that's a server and a client using your UDP, you need to do that check and control. It's not up to the protocol to do that for you. Okay. Um, the cool thing about UDP is it's very fast. Because there's not all this transactions in the middle that takes place, it's extremely fast. A, a, a UDP packet will get to the other side of the internet quicker than a TCP packet. Because there's no this control and stuff. So it depends on what it is. Like um, UDP works well for like voice calls, video streaming, stuff like that. We're not talking about YouTube, we're talking about live stuff. Stuff that's live, like a phone call, it's very live. You want it there as quick as possible. And if a packet is dropped, you can't sit and make sure the packet goes through because then suddenly the call just pauses. And then after a while, only will the other guy speak further. You don't want that. You rather drop that packet, lose a fraction of the voice, and carry on. So that everything's up to date. Okay. 
So that's the difference between UDP and TCP. UDP, uh, games, for instance, also uses UDP. Lots of games uses UDP. But with UDP in games, if a packet is dropped, it's fine. Let's say you're sending a position of a certain person in the map. This X and Y location and Z location, how he's looking and what gun he has or whatever. There's a packet that carries that. It doesn't matter if that one packet's corrupt. Because literally 50 or 10 milliseconds later, there's going to be another packet. That's going to have more up-to-date information anyway. So you can just drop the next one. So the guy will just, instead of uh, um, running smoothly through the map, he'll just stop and jump. But it'll only happen now and then, obviously, if there's a faulty network. So that's where UDP does have a big role to play, even though a lot of these mechanisms and stuff is removed, it doesn't exist. Then there's the last one is the ICMP, is ICMP um, protocol. That is, it works very similar to UDP. There's no control and checking and stuff. But it's mostly for network tools. So ping, for instance, works through it. Um, trace root works through it. So yeah, some of these commands use that protocol. It's actually to, to test the network itself. It's tool to debug the network and see if the network is working. That's usually what your ICMP protocol is for. I think initially it was used for other stuff as well, but I'm not sure when I have to research, research that. Okay, so yeah, that's connections. TCP is a connection. UDP is actually related. Obviously they both contain ports. If there's connection through the internet, it's on the, the path, it's called the socket, and the protocol is either TCP, UDP, or ICP. Okay. Any questions? Does everyone understand? You happy? Cool. Ports, also mentioned here, is a, is a number. It's a number used, obviously, if you have a communication between two points but you want to send uh, um, different applications, wants to do different things, you have multiple connections between the same two points, then you need port numbers to differentiate them. Okay. Port numbers is also used uh, to, if it's a, if it's a client, the, 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 the source port number is usually just an identifier for the, the specific connection, the specific socket. Okay, so obviously the packet will carry a source IP and port. So for a client, that port number is just a unique identifier. Because you can actually open up a lot of sockets to exactly the same destination IP. But they're still different sockets. So like multiplexing. Let's read up on multiplexing. Multiplexing is if you uh, uh, send multiple streams of information through the same medium. So technically port numbers allows us to do multiplexing. So the client, this source port number is just a unique identifier. On the server, the server always listens on a certain port number. And that port number is always fixed static. But on the client side, it usually gets decided randomly. You can, if you code a socket, you can actually, what they call it binding, you actually bind to a static port number, but you don't actually need to. I've never actually had a case where that is actually a requirement for a client outgoing socket. But if you have a server socket, you must bind to a local static port number. That usually identifies the application. So each application, or application type rather, will have a specific port number. Now in ports, there's a certain range of ports. It's obviously the port number can start at 1 and can go up to 65,535. But this, very similar to subnets, very similar to private subnets, public subnets, there are um, a certain pre-allocated port numbers and post-allocated ports or uh, custom port numbers. So the first one from 0 to 1024. Oh. 1024. So the that's the first range. So port numbers 1 to 1024 are actually pre-allocated. I think, you need to check that on there, but I think the IETF side of those problems. They are application types. Like HTTP, it's port number 80. If you SSH to into a server, it's port number 22. Always. 
HTTP is always 80. You can obviously configure a web server to have custom port numbers, but most of the time it's 80. If it's an HTTPS connection, it's 434. That's it. If you look up an HTTPS port number, it will say 434. Uh, POP, I think, is 110. SMTP is 25. FTP is 21. Secure POP, I think, is 993. But they're all below that port number. Okay. Then, anywhere above that, so 1,025 upwards to 65,000, is custom board numbers. So you basically make up your own. If you have an application that's not in that range, you can just make up board numbers. But if you make it a board number, you can make it a board number. Obviously, if you communicate that to, <laughs> to um, uh, let's say you develop an application, you have a board number, and it needs to go to, you've got a public server, and there's clients, applications that need to be installed on some computer somewhere. You need to, and it's, let's say, in a corporate company. You need to tell the guys in the corporate company to allow that port on their firewall. Otherwise, the firewall doesn't block that port. Because that's a good way to control um, uh, traffic on your network, especially traffic that goes out to the internet. It's a very nice way to control it. You should only allow certain port numbers. Because, for, for instance, um, if you only allow port 80 and 443, then it means people can only browse the web. It means they can't check email, they can't open SSH connections, they can't FTP, they can't uh, download torrents. All those things does not work. Because you only allowed port 80 and port 443. You see. But yeah, so ports get used in multiple ways. But initially, it's just to identify an application. To say, I want to connect to that PC, but on that PC, I want to connect to that application. Because obviously, the PC, the whole PC will have an IP address. But there's multiple applications using that same IP address to wait for connections. So they must each wait on a port number. If you open a server on a port number that another application is already listening on, you'll get an error. The operating system will tell you, sorry, you can't. And you just actually can't, you can't bind to that port, it will just deny you. Okay. In Linux, I know, if you want to bind to these port numbers, you need to be root. Uh, it might just be Ubuntu. I don't know if it's Linux per se, but Ubuntu, Linux, one of the two. If you want to bind to that port number, you must be root. So that also is a bit of a security measure for Linux that uh, viruses and stuff can't just hijack the port numbers because they might not run as a root because the virus infected the PC via your user account. So it can't just do whatever it wants to do. Okay. I think that covers ports. Do you understand ports? Right? Cool.